All right. Hey, folks, it's Faz here from Faz Lift. Today, I'm going to be talking about how most people really just pay lip service to health, how they go off their subjective feeling or even worse, someone else's opinion rather than hard data on themselves. And I'm going to talk you through a couple of ways you can decide on that for yourself using hard data from your own body. But uh, firstly, thanks for making it onto my channel. If you have any questions or comments about today's video, pop them down below. And if you'd like to work with me on your own strength and physique goals, there's a link in the description. So let's get started. All right. So first of all, a very common question that comes up is, should I bulk or should I cut? And it's all related to, should I go up in weight or should I go down in weight? And this can be problematic either way. If you're very fat and ergo, you're potentially unhealthy or you're verging on being unhealthy, going up and weight further could be unhealthy for you could be bad for your health if you're very lean continuing to stay at that leanness or go down even further could also be very bad for you so people generally rely on fairly subjective measures what do i look like in the mirror but how about we explore some better ways some hard data so people generally rely on either time frame so they'll say okay i'm going to bulk for 16 weeks then i'm going to cut for four weeks or i'm going to gain 20 pounds i'm going to drop 20 pounds those are all very subjective, very, they're markers which don't really pay attention to what the body is doing during the process of those timeframes or of those goals. Things, bad things could be happening during the course of a cut, which means you need to cut the short, cut the cut short. But if you've got a time frame in your mind of say 16 weeks, then you're going to carry on pushing through, even though it's not the best for you. The other ways that people decide on this thing is they ask their favorite, Hey, should I bulk or should I cut? And that's pretty crazy as well, because if it's, if you're thinking about it from a health based perspective what, what do they know about your health they don't know anything they're just basing it off your physique your aesthetics now subjective opinion just how that's even worse you're just going off how you feel day by day which generally led to people either stagnating or getting into unhealthy ways so to really decide on whether to bulk or cut or what to do with your weight right based on your health and trying to get healthy or be as healthy as possible, or at least maintain as much health as possible while you're bulking and cutting, you need something which is more objective. You can't rely on these measures, timeframes, goals, someone else's opinion, or just how you feel in the morning. You need something objective. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, another thing is that people pay a lot of lip service to what they consider to be health. And a lot of this I've come to realize on social media is just virtue signaling BS by social media influencers. Like people will say, yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I eat a healthy diet. I eat a balanced diet. Now, someone will say, yeah, I'm, I'm healthy because I eat keto or I'm healthy because I'm vegan. I'm healthy because I'm carnival. And then you get some other guy propping along goes, well, actually I do the if it's your macros. I'm healthy because I don't, I don't skip any food or food group. They're all virtue signaling BS really, because none of them objectively know whether they're healthy or not, unless they're doing some of the things which I talk about in this series. So. This, the uh, video I uh, posted a couple of weeks, uh, a couple of days ago, looked at nutrition and essentially how you know whether you have any nutritional deficiencies or not. So just because you're eat, having a, a one particular eating style like keto, vegan or whatever, it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to be filling in all those deficiencies. Just because you are eating a balanced diet and you're trying to fit in everything doesn't mean you're going to be healthy either. So what I'm talking about in this series is objective measures to know whether you're on the right track or not. So not just what ends up to be just diet wars between groups, which is really what it is. And what we do is we go on social media and we look for people who match up with our expectations. So if you're a carnivore guy, you'll look at carnivore resources and everyone will go, yeah, I'm in great health. Fantastic. If you're a vegan guy, you look at vegan resources and everyone's going, yeah, I'm in great health. And social media makes this worse too, because our things that we look at, our choices of searches, they are optimized so that whenever we go onto social media, the experience is all based around what we search for. So, you know, if you're a keto guy, everything you see is going to be keto. So now all of that lends itself into this bubble where we think we're fine. Okay. And like I said, in the last video, everyone's fine until they're not. What I want to give you guys is some objective markers to show you whether you're healthy or not. So what we're talking about today is biomarkers. So there's biological markers. This is a measurable indicator showing the presence or the severity of health or disease. Keyword here is measurable. It gives you objective feedback. And the two that I'm going to talk about today are firstly, resting heart rate. Now, resting heart rate is super easy to track these days. Most uh, digital watches will track your resting heart rate. You won't even have to get anything particularly special. Fitbits, 
Apple Watches, any number of very cheap resting heart rate trackers on the market will allow you to do that, okay? And so generally it's quite easy, just wear your, wear your wrist strap, get your heart rate checked, it's fine. If you're a watch guy, wear your watch on one wrist, perhaps wear your heart track on the other. But in general, just track your resting heart rate. It's a good idea to do, and if you're at least a little bit concerned with your health, you should be wearing your wrist tracker at least most days of the week. I wear mine all the time. Now, in terms of what is a healthy amount, medically speaking, normal is anywhere between 60 to 100. I don't really buy that though. I prefer mine around 40 to 60. I'm generally in the uh, low 50s. Now, I just, I found out through researching this presentation for you guys, that means I'm in the athletic range for my age group, which is fantastic. So I'm pretty happy with that, but that's generally where we should be at. You can see here, based on your age range, you get a resting heart rate. In general though, I feel that anywhere between 40 to 60 is acceptable. I don't really think the 60 to 100 that your doctor would tell you is good is particularly great. I personally feel if your resting heart rate is in the 70s, you're verging on trouble. So it behoves you to do everything you can to get that down to the 50 to 60 range. And if you're at 50, 60, you're pretty good. If you're 40 to 50, don't worry, you're probably still fine. You've probably got like more of an athletic heart rate. But that's how I feel we're looking for ideal measures. I know once your heart rate gets above 80 on a regular consistent basis as a resting heart rate, that means your heart is having to beat really hard just to keep the lights on. That's a bad place to be. At that stage, you've really got to really switch on to what's going on in your life in terms of training, diet, body fat being a big uh, measure. But resting heart rate allows us to have what is basically instant daily feedback on our nutrition state, our sleep state, our stress state. Also just more medium and long-term, what is our body doing in terms of health? If I'm sitting there at about 55 to 60 heart rate, I'm feeling pretty good, that's fine, okay? Now, if you're in the middle of a bulk and your heart rate's getting up there, but you've decided, or let's say your coach has told you we're gonna carry on bulking for another 12 weeks, then you've gotta stop and think, okay, there's something I'm doing here which is wrong and it's messing me up. Do I want to carry on down this path when my body is literally telling me slow down? Or you might be sat there thinking, well, should I bulk or should I cut? It's a common question. Should I bulk? Should I cut? I don't know what to do. And when you're just starting training, you don't really know how fat you are. A lot of guys will walk around, they'll say on the internet, hey, I'm lean, I'm fine. For a competitive bodybuilder, somebody will look at them and go, actually, you're more like 20, 25% body fat. They won't believe you because you, <laughs> you have that kind of confidence when you're untrained. And they'll, their heart rate might be in 65, 70, 75, something along those lines. So it's more of an objective measure to say, hey, slow down. Before you got the ideas about bulking, Maybe get that body fat under control. Maybe get that heart rate under control so you've got less of a stress on your heart on a day-by-day -day basis just when you sat down. So again, it's important. It's an objective marker and it's something which is super easy to track. Next up, blood pressure. You can get a 20 pound blood pressure monitor for home use, dirt cheap, 20 quid off Amazon. A uh, quick tip on that, by the way, if you're a bigger guy, like your arms or anything over about 16 inches, get a larger cuff. You'll, you'll get a, a wonky reading if you have a normal cuff, if you're a bigger guy. The top number is systolic, the bottom number is diastolic, that's what they call them. Medically speaking, the sort of top end cutoff for normal is 120 over 80. Uh, that's, you can, the research has shown that over time, people with blood pressures about that much are still gonna be okay. The internal organs can be fine. The problem with high blood pressure is it puts a lot of stress on the internal organs. Some people have even said that like, the transient effects of lifting weights causes the higher blood pressure, which can cause problems, but we don't tend to see that in reality. What really is damaging is the constant elevated blood pressure. So if you're always, you know, over 120 over 80, that's when we start to see problems. Looking at the research, anything up to about 130 over 80 seems to be mostly okay in the literature. When we really start to see problems is people who have consistently over 130 over 80 blood pressure. That's when things get really a little bit too uncomfortable. And here, the top end of the range here is about 180. I, I personally like my blood pressure about 110 over 70. That's where I like to keep it. You can go too low at 90 over 60 being the cutoff for too low. But if you're in that range of about 90 to 60 over 110 to 70, you're pretty good. Even up to 120 over 80, you're pretty good. If you're not, again, that is an objective measure to say, hey, do something about this. 
Never mind about your bulk. Never mind about your cut. Never mind about the extra five kilo on your bench press. Never mind about getting to three plate bench. Sort this out. Otherwise, you're not going to live long enough to be able to get to those strength goals in the first place. Yeah, because it's subjective. So we're not relying on saying, hey, Faz, hey, whoever else, my favorite influencer online, what should I do? Should I book a cut? There are actually coaches out there who give this kind of advice out just based on a picture. It's insane. Take some um, control over your own health. Grab this off Amazon, 20 quid, quid blood pressure monitor for home use and start to look at, okay, I've got some objective data on myself. It feels good to take control of your health. Say, okay, this is what I've got. And the stuff that I'm showing you in this series is a lot more potentially a lot more in-depth than what your doctor might go in you with, like the video a couple of days ago, this one, and the last video in this series as well. So that's the second thing, blood pressure. Now, in terms of the advantage of doing both of these things, the heart rate and blood pressure, advantage is it's cheap. Yeah. The uh, resting heart rate tracker watch doesn't cost very much. It's probably just the watch you use on a day-to-day -day basis. Blood pressure monitor costs 20 quid. You also get very instant feedback. And both of these things are highly responsive to sleep, nutrition and stress states. So if you've had a run of really bad sleep, wham, it'll show up on your heart rate and blood pressure. If you've had a run of really poor nutrition, if you're not the diet, wham, it'll show up. Okay. It tells you a lot about your body acutely, a lot. So over time, if you continue to build up a picture of where you're at, what your blood pressure is doing, like me, I can tell you my average blood pressure is about 110 over 70. That's roughly where I'm at. If I start creeping up to 120 over 80, something's off. I've probably been working too much, not been sleeping enough, but whatever. I know something's off. My heart rate is in like the mid 50s or low 50s. If it gets up to 60, 65, which it doesn't really these days, but if it starts to get up to 60, for example, then I know something's off. And if I'm bulking, it usually means, okay, time to cut the bulk, trim down a little bit, and that calms everything down. So it gives you objective feedback, which is super, super important. No longer do you have to just sit there and think, oh, should I bulk or should I cut? You know now. Okay. Disadvantages. Um, this advantage of the resting heart rate and blood pressure is it it's not everything. Like it's something which you can do cheap, easy, daily. But it's it doesn't offer complete protection. It doesn't offer the same as blood work, heart scans, actually lifting or going under the hood and seeing what's going on. For the relatively healthy person, these are a great set of indicators. If you're not particularly healthy right now and you spend six months improving your heart rate and your blood pressure and you go back and do some blood work, you're probably gonna be better off. So it gives you daily feedback, just like you step on your scales in the morning and you go, okay, hey, or, and then over the course of a week, you might go down in weight or up in weight, or it gives you feedback. It's objective feedback on your health. And if you wanna be doing this for a long time, then it's important to take a note of these things. One thing I will say at this point is your heart rate and your blood pressure, you need to take them both. So if you sat there thinking to yourself, ah, I take my heart rate, but I don't take my blood pressure, go get yourself a blood pressure monitor, 20 quid, all right? Because you've got to view them with with each other like i there are situations where people will have resting heart rates which are low and blood pressure which is high because there's, there's a compensatory mechanism there your body will actually lower your heart rate if your blood pressure is super high and, and vice versa so there is a compensatory mechanism there ideally you want them both in range and low so it's worth tracking them both most people will track their heart rate more than their blood pressure tracking blood pressure for a lot of people is very alien but it's definitely something you should get into the habit of doing Next up, summary. So yeah, this, these are objective markers of health. They allow us to make objective decisions around bulk cut cycles, what we should do with our health. And as a result, it has a knock-on effect to our bodybuilding. Should we get bigger? Should we get smaller? What should we do? It gives us direction. It empowers us really, yeah? Rather than having to say, oh, what do I feel like doing? Or look in the mirror, which you know how the mirror can play games with your head or asking your favorite influencer who's probably just some 20 something who's just looking at a picture of you, one picture of you, trying to make a choice about that, which is madness. It just gets us some objective data. The final thing which is good is it gets us into the habit of being health focused. A lot of people who enjoy bodybuilding enjoy it for the aesthetics rather than for the health perspective. Now, when you're younger, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not going to begrudge you on that. But my goal here is for you young guys is to get you into the habit of at least being objectively measuring your health, okay? Being, paying more than just lip service to health, yeah? Having some objective data. So you can take that into your 30s and 40s. And for you older guys, if you're not doing this stuff already, or if this is something you do once a year at the doctors, come on, come on. 20 quid, get yourself a blood pressure monitor from online, dead easy. 
use it once a week check your heart rate every day well you don't even need to check it, it just your phone your watch does it for you it helps so in summary this series is about health okay it's the health series but i also want to see that what most people consider to be doing things in a healthy way is really just virtue signaling bs like i eat this way i have lots of fruits and vegetables as we saw in my video a couple of days ago lots of fruits and vegetables don't mean much because the soil quality has gone down so you're not getting as much as you think you are you're not nutritionally covered a lot of people get away with things because they're just young a lot of influencers have no freaking clue about any of this stuff a lot of influencers will tell you to put salt on your meals but won't even mention potassium that's what this series is about it's proper education on objective markers which can show you what your body is trying to tell you folks i'm going to call it there if you enjoyed this and you are not yet subscribed and would like to support the channel then go ahead and subscribe if you'd like to support the channel please leave a comment down below i'm going to call it there see you on the next one